Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Third Church this morning. We're so glad that you're here today. I forgot my Bible in the back room while we were praying there, so I'm going to need that for one of the verses I'm going to share here in a second. So the morning is um, just a tad bit gloomy out there, but it's warm. It's a good day to be here in the house of God, and we're so glad that you're here. Today's message is going to be um, uh, Mike's uh, final message on uh, the Rooted series, and we're going to talk about praise today. And um, as we uh, as we go through this um, and prepare us ourselves for praising God, one of the things that we always do is we got to remember who we are, and we've got to let that spirit move in us. And uh, Romans eight verse eleven, I think, says it nice and succinctly. It says, "And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just um, want you to come in a mighty way today that your Holy Spirit would come and fill us, fill us more than we could ever hope or imagine, that we would praise you and we would worship you because of all that you have done that your son Jesus Christ came to this earth and that he gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. So Lord God, would you turn our hearts to you? Would you turn our minds towards you as we listen to your word today? We thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Feel it in my bones, you're about to move. I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So come.
you, Jesus. It's in your precious name we do pray. Amen. And now we're going to go ahead and take our morning tithes and offerings. You can have a seat, and the ushers will come down. Well, welcome. Let me give us a, give a lay of the land today. Uh, we, this is our final series. We've been doing this series on Rooted, and today we're gonna go probably just a little bit longer um, because of some of the nature of what we're gonna do. So once we get to the 60 minute mark, don't get all anxious on me. I know how people start looking at the back clock, but uh, we're gonna go just five or 10 minutes uh, past what we probably normally do within our hour service. Uh, And I think the Lord has something good for us. Um, Kevin always says this, that when you do serve multiple services, it's like sometimes you feel like you nail it and then there are other times you feel like you didn't. And I don't feel like I nailed it at the 810, so I'm gonna pray that this comes back around a little bit and gets to where we need to go. Uh, so if you can give me that first slide, Michelle. we have doing this series called Rooted. Uh, this is the last week of a three-week series and the idea is really simple. We wanna be a people whose hearts are being cultivated in such a way that the roots, our roots, can go down deep in Jesus, okay? And this, uh, this kind of, we've been using this, uh, these statements here over the last few weeks. We want roots that will go down deep in Christ, Roots that go down deep in him will produce a people who bear fruit that will last and they will not be uprooted by the circumstances of life. But those that, are, those that are deeply rooted experience the fullness of the kingdom while those who are not live disoriented and distracted. And in week one, uh, we talked about the word and we talked about delighting in the word and that we want this to be our guiding light. We want this to be the truth on which we stand. And we talked about uh, delighting and how this is sweet like honey. And so I need to do this again. Um, I didn't do anything with the kids. But I, the first week, if you were here, we, I, all the kids came up and got suckers. Well, the truth is I bought way too many suckers and I need to get rid of them. So if you're a kid and your parents will let you, you can come back up to the front and uh, grab some dum-dums. And uh, what we talked about was this reality uh, that the word of God is to be sweet like candy. It's sweet like honey unto our soul. So please, yes, kids, come up here. Don't be afraid, don't be shy. Come running, if you want a sucker, you can come and get one. And you can take more than one if you want. You can put a whole bunch in your pockets. And your parents can rustle them away from you. There you go. Go ahead, grab a sucker. In week two, we talked about prayer and the idea that prayer is just really simply, it's about having a conversation with God. Sometimes we can overthink prayer and we think we have to have this language. 
And what we tried to do last week was break down this idea of praying back the word by seeing the promises to believe and the commands to obey. So uh, I'm not gonna expound any further on those last two weeks. You can go back online and listen to those, but they really do kind of build on each other. So if you hadn't seen those um, or heard those, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, This next slide, uh, I didn't state this last week, but I think it's really important Um, these practices of being in the word and prayer and in praise, they need, to be every, they need to be an everyday lifestyle for us, not a once a week thing. If the only thing that is cultivating the soil of your heart is a one hour service once a week, your roots are really shallow. And I don't mean that to be religious or try to guilt you or condemn you, but the reality of the Christian faith and our walk with Jesus is if the only way that we are getting fed is by vicariously living through Kevin, uh, our roots are really shallow. And when life comes, and it will come at some point, and it will shake you, I guarantee your root system is not deep enough to sustain what this life will bring at us. And so my hope and my prayer is that actually these things of being in the word and cultivating a prayer life, and as we talk about praise, that these would actually be something that we learn to enjoy and delight. And there's something unique about how the Lord works, that when we enter into these things, as we enter into relationship with him, that it actually becomes something that is joyful. And I've stated this, that like, if God is boring to you, you need to have God blow up your picture of what he looks like and who he is. Because God is the furthest thing from boring. He is the greatest thing. He is the most beautiful, the most powerful being. He is our creator. And he, everything in this life pales in comparison to who God is. The truth is, most of us just have never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I wonder if it's because we kind of vicariously live through this one hour a week. And then we go off. And so uh, this, uh, I was thinking in preparation to this, you know, like, you know, Lord, all of us kind of, we have these perspectives and we come in with these lenses. And I, this is a funny story talking about lenses. I I have contacts and I'm I'm actually, I have really bad eyesight. (laughs) This is like disclaimer. If you ever see me up here and I stop singing words, it's because what happens is I have an astigmatism and my contacts have to be a certain place in my eye for them to focus. And what will happen is my contacts get dry and then my contacts move and I can't see anything. No lie. So I've had a really bad experience at an 810 service with a hymn that I could not remember or, or see. And so I have really bad vision. Um, I've told stories about my friend Paul in the past. And when I turned 16 years old, which turning 16 is like maybe the one, it's like I love that age because it's like freedom. I'm going to get my driver's license. And it's just a really, it's a fun part of life. And so I remember I was, I was the second in my class to get my driver's license. The first was in April, and then another, I got mine in May. Uh, But I, and I didn't have a car right away, Uh, but my friend Paul, he had a kind of a family car um, that he was gonna get to use. And it's funny because it was like a 1971, 72 uh, Chevy Impala, uh, which today, if those cars, you know, have been restored, they're really great looking cars. They're classic cars. Uh, His was not so classic. It was all rusted out. It was a red maroon color. If I, it was red maroon, it had a green door on the driver's side because the door had been replaced and they didn't do any body work, just slap the mismatched door on it. And it was known in town that it was called the beast. You know, in cars back then, they were just built differently. I mean, they were something beastly about these cars. And so we decided I was going to take his car and we were going to go over to Clear Lake, you know, and you do cool, th- you go cruising when you're 16 and you're looking for girls and all this stuff. And so I, we went out and we went over to Clear Lake and uh, Paul, he has glasses and his would be like what mine would be if I had glasses. They were a little bit thicker um, and we pull up to this stop sign and another car pulls up and it's a car full of girls. Like, this is like, yes, this is what this is all about. And so, you know, we're like looking back and forth and uh, I'm not really totally paying attention because I'm driving and all of a sudden is, Paul's just like, go, go, go. And I'm like, what? Like, we need to be cool next to this car full of girls. And what had happened was, and I didn't hear it, as a girl from in that car yelled over to my friend and she said, nice Coke bottles. And so 
you know what Coke bottles are? They're, you know, it's like glasses that are super thick. They make your eyes just a little bit bigger. And so my friend got super embarrassed. Well, I hadn't heard. And so I'm just like still staying there by him, nice and cool, and he's getting all embarrassed. And this idea of lenses uh, is, is not only unique physically to us, it also is unique to how we perceive reality. So uh, studies, and I, I think these to be true, um, and I forget there's a phrase that actually is used with this, that our first experience in anything in life, and a lot of this happens when we're young, our first experience will create a lens with which we will now perceive that same situ situation through for the rest of our life. Now, that can be changed spiritually, but for many of us, our, our first experience will dictate how we now view something for the rest of life. So parents, you know, this is why and I'm not gonna go any further than this, but this is why teaching healthy sexuality is so important because you don't want the first lens of your kid, their sexuality, to be at the playground. Because they now, even though you can talk about it later, they have a lens that has been created. So for all of us, we have all kinds of lenses. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. For me, I grew up in church, so I have a lens kind of of religion. I grew up in church. I was there Thursdays, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. And it was a traditional church and a holiness church, and it was great. But there's a certain lens that I have that I now, and I'm learning how to correct it, how I would read scripture and how I would see things. And for some of us, we have these in church. There are lenses within the Reformed church. Some of them are honestly are tradition, not necessarily this. Traditions aren't all bad, and so what I was saying, like, Lord, help us to see where we just have lenses that actually need to be taken away, that you need to correct them so that as I view life, as I view spirituality, as I view church in this world, that I would see them with your lenses and not my lenses. So that makes sense? So today I'm gonna talk about praise, being rooted in praise. And this might be the hardest one because, you know, when we talk about the word and we talk about prayer, those are things that most of the time are individual. They're things that we're doing outside of this place. When we talk about praise, there's definitely an individual component that we do it, but a lot of our praise is about often the corporate gathering. And for some of us, we have lenses on how we view worship, on how we view praise, and I wanna hopefully help correct some of that. And I'm just saying, Lord, would you bring revelation so that we would see more of who you are? And so we're gonna talk about praise today. And I, I wanna you know, make this disclaimer, I've said it before, uh, but praise and worship, they are not, so back up, sorry. Music, when we do this thing, we get up here, sing, and play our songs, that is an expression of praise and worship. That is not praise and worship. So hopefully you do not define worship and praise by the music that we do up here on a Sunday morning because that's not the definition. What we do up here and what we do out here together, this is, that is an expression of our praise, is an expression of our worship. And that for some of us, that's a lens that we've had that lens for a long time. Well, the worship and the praise, that's the music portion, right? Like that's a lens we've put on. Can I say that's not a true biblical lens? And we're gonna unpack some of that and you'll, you'll see it. And we're, we're, we've been learning this over the last few years, so that's not fully new for us. So I wanna talk about praise and why, you, you might ask, well, why not worship? And I think it's because, I think the worship thing is easy for us to understand, praise is not. Uh, and just a simple statement, praise and worship are different and yet they're the same. They're different and yet they're the same. And I'm gonna just quickly unpack them so we can focus on praise. I've used the example in the past when we think about praise, um, you know, I'm a big football fan. I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. This is our year, I think, to win the Super Bowl in a new stadium, which ironically, I think there is a hope in the house for their new stadium this weekend that I'm missing to be here teaching, which is fine. Um, <laughs> I'm a big Vikings fan, but, uh, you know, the Vikings rivals, the Green Bay Packers, they have this quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. He is a great quarterback. So I can praise Aaron Rodgers. Praise is something that is expressed. I can say, you know what, yes, Aaron Rodgers, you are a great quarterback. The one thing I do not do is I do not worship Aaron Rodgers. I don't like him on the field. I'm sure he's a great guy, but he's the rival. And so I do not put my worship on Aaron Rodgers, but he is a good quarterback. He is a great quarterback in the NFL. So I can praise Aaron Rodgers and not worship. 
We can actually come here and we could actually praise, sing a song, raise a hand, and not worship. Now, worship, as we see it in Scripture, and Jesus talks about that, worship actually should be this thing that flows from the depths of who we are. Worship is what we ascribe worth to, really, in all of life. Now, what we want is for praise and for worship actually to come together. We want praise as we express it, as we sing, as we lift hands, as we clap, as we shout, as we do these expressions that we're gonna talk about. We actually want that to be out of a heart that is good, right? Like we want our hearts to be good towards God. And I think in the tradition of the, Re- of the Reformed Church, I think we're great at the worship thing. Um, you know, I think we're great at engaging our hearts and our minds for sure. I'm not so sure we're great at the praise thing at the actual expression of what praise looks like. And this is where some of the anxiety comes in for us. Of like, oh no, is he gonna make me get up there and dance in front of people? You like, you like we have this anxiety around it. So I wanna unpack some of this but, and talk about why praise becomes so important. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 20, 441. And I I love this story. I've used it, I believe I used it even last year when I talked about praise and worship a year ago. And I wanna use it again because I felt like I got some new insight and it's just a great story when we talk about praise. And so let me, before we read this, let me kind of define praise. I'm gonna do this based on scripture. So if you can give me, Michelle, uh, the... One that just says praise defined, it says yada and halal. Yep, number five, thanks. This, these are the biblical definitions for praise. And it's interesting in the language, in the translation, is that wherever you see the word praise, there's actually the opportunity for that to be like five or six different Hebrew words. Um, the English version, English language did not translate some of these things very well. And these are, these first four here at the top are the four most common words that are used for praise when we are in the Old Testament. And the first is yada, which is to use or hold out the hand, to throw or shoot. It is to revere or worship with extended hands. The next one is halal. This is where we get the word hallelujah. And halal means to shine, to boast, to make show. It is to make a fool of, to be clamorously foolish, to rave, to celebrate. Halal is the most used word for praise in the Old Testament. And it is by far the most demonstrative. Then we have tohalal, which is adoration or thanksgiving that is sung. And then shabak, which is to address in a loud tone, to commend, to give glory. This is where you get the shouting of praise. And what is interesting about every word that is used for praise in the Old Testament, there is always a physical component to it. There is always an expression of physicality, either in vocalizing something, in the lifting of hands, in being clamorously foolish. And it's, and it's weird because somehow what we've done is I feel like we've kind of dummied down what praise really looks like in the Western world. So we're gonna unpack that. Those last words uh, are the Greek words that are found in New Testament and they're very similar uh, to those words. So let's uh, go to Second uh, Chronicles 20. And we're just gonna look at this idea of praise and this idea of expressing uh, physically the greatness of who God is. Starting in verse one, it says this, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. And so if you write in your Bible or in the margins, you need to write Ephesians chapter six next to this verse. And I do this a lot with Old Testament scripture. Anytime I see war or battle, I I need to remind myself of the New Testament reality. In Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10, we've, we've read this. Kevin goes to this a lot. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. And so there is this reality 
that we, we find ourselves in this spiritual battle. There are demons and there are angels and there is a war raging over the souls of humanity. And so we have to always remember that when we think about the battle and we think about the stuff that our country is going through and we think about dealing with one another, my struggle is never against another person. My struggle is a spiritual battle. We wanna make this personal and it can feel very personal because of the nature of it. But when we see things like racism and anger and hatred, like those There is something physical about that, but those are strongholds and principalities that are coming down, and that is what our battle is against. It is against those types of things. And so I need to be reminded of that. And when I was, I've I've read this scripture a lot because I I love it so much. I mean, over the years, I've gone to it. And and when I I went to it this time, I was like, Lord, I, I need you to give me some new revelation. So we've talked about this. We need more revelation of who God is and what he does. And in the, you know, as we talk about praise today, this is what I don't, this could happen, is what we could see is praise is this means to getting something. So like if I praise God, maybe it'll change my situation. If I praise God, maybe I'll receive this healing. If I praise God, maybe this person will get saved. If I praise God, this will happen. I don't, we can't define praise like that because that is not what praise is about. This is not about doing something that manipulates God into doing something. We praise God for one reason, because he is worthy. I sing songs of praise. I physically express myself because God is worthy. That is the reason. Now, what we'll see is there are, there are things that happen. There are outcomes that happen that as we praise him, and this is what I always knew, when we praise and when we worship, something changes the spiritual dynamics. It changes the spiritual realities in our individual lives and in our corporate life. And so I'm like, God, like, what is that? There's something different when we praise, but I know it's, it's not a weapon per se. Like, I don't wanna call it a weapon. And in that, it was, it was crazy. The Lord just said this. He said, praise gives you the high ground. Praise gives you the high ground. And so we're reading a story about a battle that we're gonna read about, and that started to make sense to me of like, in battle, there's tactical strategies. For those of you that have served in our, you know, the many services and the Marines and the Army, Air Force, all those, this is just common speak for them. You always want the high ground in battle because it gives you the greatest perspective. It gives you the greatest vision. It is always harder to attack uphill. There's so many things about the high ground. And I, I help, this principle help, I understood a little bit because I, I like to read books about like the Navy SEALs and military stuff. It just is fascinating to me. And the Navy SEALs are fascinating because they're kind of considered um, the elite of the elite, especially in the Navy. Like these guys are trained soldiers and they are the best of the best at what they do. And their training is crazy. There's documentaries. I mean, their first week of that, this is to get into it. They call it hell week that they have to go through. And the percentage is very, very small of people that will make it through that week. I mean, they put them through mental and physical strain that you're just not supposed to go through. And it's because they want the best of the best. And uh, back in, or I believe it was 2005, uh, we were in Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, and I, I was reading a book. Some of you may have seen the movie Lone Survivor, and it's based on a true story, and it is four Navy SEALs that are sent out on a mission, and they are going after a very high-valued target. There's a leader that they are trying to find within the Taliban, and they, he, they, he keeps escaping them, and they finally feel like they've got him in this village, and so they send these four trained SEALs out, to go get him or to eliminate him. And uh, the story, what happens is as they go out, uh, they end up getting caught by some, some goat herders and they go and actually tell the Taliban. And they, from their accounts, from, there's one person that survives, not to give the story away, it's called Lone Survivor, but one of the SEALs, he survives and he, they estimate there was 180 to 200 Taliban that had come after them. And he talks about this idea, they could never get to the high ground. The Taliban always had the high ground and kept pushing them down and pushing them down. And four of the best soldiers in the world could not defeat an an inferior army. 
And it was amazing how many people, how many, how well they did in this battle. But they, and I'm gonna read this because he, he talks about it in his book. And he just says this. I guess that the oldest military strategy in the world is to gain the higher ground. In my experience, no Taliban commander had ever ordered his men to fight from anything other than the high ground. And did they ever have it now? And so as I was reading this story in Second Chronicles, it just made sense that what happens is when we praise God, it puts us on the high ground against the enemy. But what happens is so many of us, we try to fight the enemy at neutral, on the neutral ground. And there are ways that he's defeated and things like that. But what praise does is it puts us on the high ground because what is happening is when we praise God, God is being exalted. God is being lifted up. He is being enthroned in a city or a situation in our lives. And we actually join him on that high ground. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. We're gonna unpack this a little bit more. Second Chronicles 20, verse two. So some men came and they told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazan Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The word Judah means praise. Judah means praise. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord and in front of the new courtyard, and he said these things. And what he does is he goes in and he begins to pray to the Lord and he begins to magnify the Lord. He begins to remind the people of who God is, reminding them of the greatness of God, the things that God had done. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm not gonna read through that s- section. Let's skip down to verse 13. Verse 13. All of the men of Judah with their wives and their children and little ones, they stood there before the Lord. And then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. Some of you are fighting battles that are not meant to be fought by you. You need to give it to the Lord. You need to give it to the Lord. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the pass of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. So Jehoshaphat, he bowed with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they fell down and they worshiped the Lord. Then some of the Leavites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. And after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And that's from Psalm 136. My guess is they probably, they probably quoted that entire Psalm, that entire chapter. Verse 22, as they began to sing and praise. So let me back up. I mean, this is just a little bit crazy, you know, that the idea of we would go into battle and we're just going to put our worshipers and our praisers out in front of our soldiers. We're gonna go out in this battle and we're just gonna sing, we're gonna praise, we're gonna clamorously look foolish before our enemy and we're just gonna trust that the Lord is gonna win this battle for us. Like that's a pretty bad strategy. I mean, I'm not stupid, not too wise. But it's amazing what happens. Verse 22, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. They were defeated The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they had finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And so as the people of God, they go out, they're praising, they're worshiping, they're exalting God, they're making him famous. 
the enemy begins to turn on itself. And I really believe this. What is happening is God is saying, guess what? I'm the high ground. Get on it and just praise me and watch and see what happens. See the victory that I bring. And so for us as a people of God, what we wanna do is we wanna be a people of praise. We wanna be a people who are exalting God. And it's not only about what we do here. This is about also individually. You know, being vulnerable, um, you know, I... I like this word called the secret place. It's this place where we get alone with God in the word and in prayer. And I'm learning to cultivate this in me that there are times when I'm by myself that I'm just on the floor with my hands in the air praising God. Sometimes no music, no singing, but it's me saying, Lord, I need to be on that high ground with you. I'm gonna praise you for who you are because you are good. And when we praise him, just our perspectives change, it, it changes. And so I wanna just go through some practical things about praise and I've uh, been trying to do this every week and this is gonna lead us kind of into just uh, praising and worshiping him. And so if I can have that first slide, number nine, why praise? And so, you know, you know why, why praise? You know, why sing? Why raise your hands? You know, why look foolish to the Lord? Because I say this, the, the reality is, this is, it's weird, honestly, from if you, the worldly perspective, when we come together and sing and we do this stuff, it's weird. I mean, it really is. The world would look at this and be like, that is silly. You know, it's, we just don't get in groups like this for the most part and go, hey, let's go join each other and sing and do the stuff that we do. So like there's something about praise that is unique to the kingdom of what God has established. And so here's the wise. You know, God is worthy and he just deserves it. Like we, that is, I mean, that's, that could be the only bullet point there. Like because God is worthy, we're gonna praise him. Because of what Jesus has done for him, we're gonna praise him. But also it makes God bigger. It makes him bigger than our situation. It makes him bigger than our circumstance. When our hearts move to that place of praising God, God gets bigger. You know, as we lift up God, as we exalt him, it gives him permission to take his place in our lives, our cities, and in our nations. There's some spiritual dynamics that we can't go into here, but there's this reality that when we praise him, it gives God permission, says, God, you come into this situation. You come into this space. You come into our city as we praise you and as we exalt you. Because of its physical nature, it helps us to worship holy. What I mean by that is we actually, our bodies, our hearts, our minds, they all come together to worship God and to praise him with all that we are. It helps us to reorient and have proper perspective. And praise will not always change your circumstance, but it will change your perspective. So if you're in a situation for whatever reason that like life is hard or things are not going your way, There are moments that I believe praise will change things. And it's not because praise does, it's because in our praise, God comes and he does something. But I know this, praise will always change your perspective and your outlook. We'll always do that. Next slide. So, you know, so what does praise look like? And I've talked a little bit about these. You know, praise is always physically expressed. Praise is not praise unless it is physically expressed. It is, and we see this, these are the main ones we see in scripture, that it's vocalized and sung. So that's why we do this in the church world. It's musically expressed. You know, we see that it's shouted. Uh, We do it with hands raised. We see dancing, clapping, bowing. There's this physical expression to our praise. And the truth is, when when it's physical in nature, there is a sacrifice to be made, a sacrifice of how I feel in the moment, of my pride and of my emotions. Going to the next slide, you know, so when do we praise beyond us coming together? Like we need to have it daily in every moment. Psalm 34 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. His praise will always be on my lips. We want to praise him in the good and in the bad, when life is hard and when life is good. Praise him in the secret place, what I talked about. And we want to praise him together. There's something beautiful about when we come together corporately to do this. And then as you praise, this next slide. These are hopefully just some helpful tips. Like, you know, as we do this thing corporately or when you're by yourself, 
These are things I found useful. You know, fix your thoughts on Jesus. That's why you'll see people that close their eyes. Like I like to close my eyes because it helps remove distractions. It helps me to be able to kind of help my thoughts out. And so what I do is I like to think about the words of the song. Um, I like to picture and think about the cross, actually having mental pictures come into my head. Uh, the throne room in heaven, Revelation 4 and 5, are a great picture. I like to go have these pictures in my head because it just helps connect my praise with what's in my head. You know, learn how to dialogue with God. We talked about this last week, you know, that we just need to get better at having conversation with God, that in the midst of our singing, we actually can be dialoguing with him. We can thank him for the truths that we are singing. You know, we can declare the truths into your life situation. So if there's a song we're singing, we're like, yes, I need to declare that truth into my life, into that relationship, into that situation. You actually begin to do that with God in the midst of our praise. So it goes beyond just us getting together and singing songs. Like this is about us connecting with our creator. We wanna keep praising in the space. Uh, in the space, what I mean by that is kind of like the in-betweens of songs. It's in the instrumentals. It's in those places where we're not singing and sometimes we're not sure what we're supposed to do. We actually can continue to gauge our hearts and engage our minds, engage our bodies in those moments. You know, sometimes we have in between songs that just, there's like this awkwardness. Well, that awkwardness is because we actually, we stop praising. That awkwardness will all be removed if you stay in the moment of praise. And we wanna move to that place where we're actually having communion with God because this is all about relationship. It's about allowing our hearts to be opened and moved by God. Next slide, some common hindrances. I invite the worship team to come up. Here's some common hindrances to praise. You know, so for some of us, our picture of God is just too small. And so because of that, God isn't, eh, God's just God, he's up in the sky. He's not really worthy of me singing, not worthy of me bowing or lifting my hands. He's just, he's my ticket to heaven, hope I get there. Like that paradigm needs to just be blown up for us. Like God is the great, God is awesome. He is great. Because of what Jesus has done for us, that is worth praising God for. And that just shows his bigness. You know, there's sometimes there's life situations that seem bigger than God's ability to handle it. Um, pride and fear. Uh, this idea of pride, um, I'm a big Star Wars nerd. I love Star Wars. Wasn't real pumped about one, two, and three. They were lackluster at best. Uh, but <clears throat> in, in episode three, there's this epic battle between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. And Anakin Skywalker is about ready to turn into Darth Vader. And if you know the premise, you know, Darth Vader is the main character. He represents evil. And in the beginning, he's not evil. He goes through this progression of being good and he becomes evil and then eventually becomes good again. Uh, but in this battle, there's this scene and it's a really long lightsaber battle. It is kind of like the master and the learner and Anakin is the learner and Obi-Wan, they get in this situation and Anakin is down lower and Obi-Wan is actually on the higher ground and this is what he says. He tells Anakin, he says, it's over Anakin, I have the higher ground. And Anakin, it's interesting what he says. This is about pride. And he says, you don't know how powerful I am. And Anakin, in his pride, he tries to do this jump and Obi-Wan cuts him down. And I think we do, we do this all the time. In our pride, you know, there are things about praise that like, uh, I don't wanna go there. And I don't know if there's anything that hardens our heart more than pride. And so there's also the fear of others. Uh, there's lack of revelation of just how important praise is, which we're trying to unpack. We can use our personality as a crutch. I wanna speak to this. You know, our, our personalities are flawed by the sinful nature. And so we have to be really careful. So some of us say, well, I'm introverted. I'm not very expressive. That's, you know, it's just not me. Well, I said it last week. You know, what, what does this say about the ways that the Lord invites us into relationship. And this is, I mean, this is tricky. This is, I don't, I don't wanna bring guilt or condemnation, but I do want us to be careful about using that as a crutch. You know, just because the Lord hasn't made you expressive doesn't mean that actually the best way to praise God is not to be expressive then. Like we have to be careful about using our personalities as a crutch. And we can use the opposite. I've seen it in the charismatic world. Well, I'm just expressive and I can just do whatever I want. And then you actually can become a hindrance to others because you're just crazy and doing your own thing all over the place. You can take it to the extremes. 
but we don't wanna use our personality as a crutch to actually enter into praise and into worship. Um, we use our past experiences or tradition to dictate the hows. Um, you know, praise, it's uncomfortable, so we're just like, I'm not gonna do it. And because of circumstances or situations, we think that praise isn't the proper response. And the reality is there's never a situation where praising God is not the proper response. There's never. Even in our brokenness and our sinfulness, you can come into this place and be in the worst place in the world, and the proper response is always to praise God because he meets us there. And so for us, I don't want us to, I don't want us to move to this shame, guilt, because, and this is hard, because here's the reality, you know, in praise because of its expressiveness and what it is, like, well, you can tell who's doing it or not. And that gets really awkward. <laughs> can I just say it? It just is, and so what I want us to do is that we want this place, we want this church, we want this to be a place of freedom. And we're always at different places in our walk with Christ. And so I want us to, in our freedom, I want us to worship and praise God biblically and kind of as he is moving us along. So I'll be a little bit blunt. There's some of us that have been, we love Jesus and love God, and we need to move to higher places of praise. We just, we just do. We need to get out of that comfort zone, out of that box. And we just need to allow it to, to do something in our hearts. And we need to be on that high ground with Jesus where he is exalted. And so what we're gonna do is, you know, for about the next 20, uh, 25 minutes, we're, we're just gonna praise, we're gonna worship. And so I just encourage you today, you know, like maybe you're not a singer. You know, nowhere in scripture does it say sing uh, perfect in pitch, sing good. It just says sing joyfully. So like if you're worried about how you sound, man, just do it with lots of joy and gusto. Like just sing joyfully for the Lord. For some of you, a first step is gonna be like, you're gonna raise your hands for the first time. You know, we're, you're gonna clap, you're gonna, but you're gonna do something that actually expresses the greatness of what God is. You're gonna praise him. You're gonna worship him. And in this, just allow your heart to be soft in that. Like I said, I don't want this to be about guilt and condemnation. Like we want freedom to reign and we wanna grow in Christ. So why don't you stand, let me pray for us. We pray, Lord, that you now would just be exalted in the things that we would do in this place. And I thank you that you are not a God of guilt or condemnation, but I know that you want us to grow, you want us to become more like you, and that you give us these expressions, you give us these tools to connect more deeply with you. And so I pray that just in these moments that there would be a lot of freedom, that you would be exalted and we thank you, Jesus, because of what you done, have done for us, that you have died on the cross and that you rose again. And if maybe today that's the only thing that we're gonna cling to is just our salvation in you. And so we lift you up and we lift our eyes to you in Jesus' name, amen. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless with awe and wonder the king of glory the king above
brought chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of Glory, the King above all.
So what I wanted to, want to do is kind of bring all these things together. So, you know, the first week we talked about the word, last week we talked about prayer and this reality of kind of praying back the word to increase our kind of our prayer vocabulary. And then we're in the midst of praise. And so what I want us to do is we're going to read the scripture together as the congregation. Then we're going to just, I'm going to have you read it silently. And then I'm going to direct us in some praying out of the scripture. So if you're here last week, we talked about praying promises to believe. We thank the Lord for promises to believe. And I love this verse for who it says we are. And so let's, uh, pr- let's say this together. Here we go. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life. So now just take 30 seconds and just, would you read it again? So now what I want you to do is just go to kind of your prayer place. And this is what I just want you to do. I want you to, th- I want you to thank the Lord for these truths. Would you just say, thank you, Lord, that I am chosen. Thank you that I am holy. Thank you that I belong to you. Just begin to just repeat those back to God, thanking him for those things. And would you just ask him, would you say, Lord, you have called me out of darkness and into your wonderful light. Would you help me to be light in this world? Would you help me to be light in my place of work? Would you help me to be light in my family? Would you help me to be light in the same way that you have called us into your light? Would we be light? So we thank you, Lord, that we are chosen, that we are a royal priesthood, that we are co-heirs with you, that we are a holy nation, that we belong to you. And we thank you that you have called us out of darkness and into light this morning. And so as we continue to praise you, Lord, would just that thought of being called into the light of who you are, would that be upon our hearts, upon our minds? Would we return to the joy of our salvation and knowing you? Oh, we love you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Your name is life. Your name is hope inside. Hope inside. Your name is Lord.
as hopefully you've experienced, you know, in these last three weeks, we just need to be a people whose roots are going down deep, deep in the word, deep in prayer, deep in praise. We want hearts that are good soil for the Lord to do what he needs to do in us. And so uh, just a quick couple last action steps. You know, we've been using this rooted in word and prayer guide. There are more. We ran out last week, and so there are more that have been printed that are in the back. It's self-explanatory if you want to pick one of those up. Um, I invite you to participate in the United Midwest event that is going to happen here at the end of the month. Um, I can't go into details, but this is a really important event and a unique event of what the Lord is doing spiritually in this region. Uh, Bethel worship, many of these songs we've been singing even today are from them. They're going to be here last Saturday of the month and some other things. You can go to their website. I encourage you to go to that and just continue to take concrete little steps in all these areas of being in the word, in prayer, and in praise. Let me bless us and we'll get out of here. Lord, I, I'm just grateful for this body, Lord, that you are growing us in all these areas. We're hearing stories of how you are at work. And so as we go, would we be your hands and feet? Would we be your light? Would we be a people rooted deeply in you? So as you go from this place today, would you know the extravagant love of our Father God? Would you know the peace and the presence of Jesus Christ? And would you know the power of the Holy Spirit. We say that we love you, Jesus. We thank you. We exalt you. In Jesus' name. If you'd like communion, elders will be available uh, to serve you or to pray for you. Uh, Have a great week. Kids, there's still more dum-dum, so if you want another one, come and get it. Blessings.